California for the fifth annual Ronnie James Dio Stand Up and Shout Cancer Fund's Bowl for Ronnie event. Here with the man, the myth, the legend, Dave Grohl. Hi, how, how are you doing, doing, brother? How's it going? Good. You are officially the kindest man in rock and roll. What? I'm a fucking asshole, just so you know. And that's why I watched you sign like 50 guitar pick guards the other day. Yeah, you know, I figure for every pick guard I sign, it's one more day alive. So if I sign a thousand pick guards, I might live to be a thousand days older than I would otherwise. Nice. Yeah. Dave, what is important to you about the Ronnie James Teal Stand Up and Shout Cancer Fund? Well, first of all, community, the community of musicians, I think is awesome. I grew up in Washington, D.C., sort of in this punk rock scene where everybody was friends, everybody was super supportive. The community of musicians was like a big deal. Everybody supported each other. So I love that. I, tonight I've seen a lot of old friends that I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, also paying tribute to Ronnie James Dio, one of the greatest singers of all time, uh, a very generous and sweet man who would give you know all of his time and energy and love and attention to do good things. He's a great guy. Wendy's the sweetest woman in the world. When Wendy comes to you and asks you to do something, you kind of can't say no. You know, she really she she brings this whole thing together. Uh, she brings all these people together, and then the cause. You know, my father died of cancer. I know a lot of people that have passed away from cancer, and so you know, the stand up and shout thing to to raise money uh, to help you know fund research or just awareness. I think you know it's a good Good thing. You kind of don't. You forget about that when you show up at a bar with all your friends and go bowling. But it, you know, we're here for a real reason. Um, but it's also really fun. So it's good to be here. Dave, how did how did Ronnie James Dio's music affect your songwriting? Well, Holy Diver is one of the best fucking albums of all time. I mean, you know, when I listen to records, I don't just listen to the vocals. I don't just listen to the drums. I listen to them, you know, I listen to it as a whole. But an album like that, like, that's kind of the perfect record. You know, Vinnie Epstein's playing on that fucking album is insane. It really, as a drummer, I listen to that record and it's like, I don't know if it's composition or if that shit was just coming off the top of his head, but... But that album, as a drummer, that album is like incredibly inspiring and influential. But the simplicity of something like that. I mean, that's one of the things I've always loved about Dio's music is that it's its not like overly complicated or orchestrated. It's a sum of like a few very simple parts and it's powerful. So, um, you know, and I mean, I fucking grew up with that shit. I remember being, I, I don't know, 13 or 14 years old and seeing stand up and shout live on like Don Kirshner's rock concert on Friday night and it just you know it makes you want to become a musician you see something like that and it's so moving and inspiring that you're like oh my god that's what I want to do for the rest of my life and um, it did that to me so Dave how is the new Food Fighters records going going to differ from Concrete and Gold's 2017's Concrete and Gold you'll hear it's fucking weird what are the what are the lyrical themes well I don't want to give up I don't want to give away too much but uh, Okay, what we're like right in the middle of it right now, so I don't know. What was the best part of interviewing a friend and former Beatle, Ringo, Ringo Starr from Rolling Stone magazine? Well, first of all, Ringo is funny. I don't know if you've ever hung out with Ringo. I mean, he's, he's, he's really funny. Um, but the best part about interviewing him is um, he's real, you know? Like, if you talk to him about Lennon or if you talk to him about George Harrison, you know, those were his friends and his family. And so when, when you start talking about that stuff, he, he gets emotional. And um, But beyond that, I mean, you know, the guy's... He's, he, I think he's the most important rock and roll drummer in that he really kind of 
you know, wrote the script for how to be the drummer of a rock band. And uh, I, I owe everything to the Beatles. That's how I learned to play music with a, my Beatles records and a songbook. I, di I didn't take lessons, I just did that. So when I get to sit and hang out with them and talk about music or life or whatever, um, not only is, is it an honor, but it's it's fun, you know. He's a good dude. He's a really good dude. Uh, Dave, why is it important for the for the Foo Fighters to encourage the reunion of Oasis? <laughs> it's not. <laughs> I think that whole thing was really taken way out of context. But here's the way I look at it. I, I love everyone. I really do. Like, I, I could get along with pretty much anyone. And when it comes to music, I feel like, you know, we're lucky enough to play it. So, um, so I think the whole Oasis thing kind of got blown out of proportion with Taylor jokingly said that we should start this petition. And then it kind of turned into this whole other thing. And I mean, I, I just love playing music, yeah. you know? And I've been lucky enough to to survive the last 30 years of doing it. So if they were to get back together and play shows, I'd be super excited for all the people that really love Oasis. Um, but if they don't, you know, I, I keep on living my life and it's cool. How do you stay humble in the face of all the fame and adulation? It's actually really easy because like this is fun and stuff, but this this isn't what it's all about. You know, it's, I wake up every morning at like 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning because I have to make sure that the coffee's ready and I've had one cup before I get three kids off to school. And then I make sure that I go to my guys in my band and we go to the studio and we do something right so that then I can get up on stage and make 50,000 people sing along and get in my bed at the end of the night without a scratch. So it's easy. I, this is great. I love this shit. It's awesome. But I just want to jam. How have you have How have you not become a casualty of sex, drugs, and rock and roll? You know, I, I stopped doing drugs when I was like 20 years old. Um, I've never done cocaine in my life. I've never done heroin. I've never done speed. I've never done any of that shit. I took a bunch of other drugs, the fun ones, until I was about 20 years old. And then I just kind of stopped. And like, you know what, I'll, it, I'll toke weed every once in a while, twice a year or something like that. But, um, you know, I'd rather like have a drink with a bunch of old buddies and, but, uh, I don't know. I, I just, I don't know. I just keep going. What do you love most about your wife and children? <laughs> I live in the craziest world of beautiful, brilliant, crazy people. <laughs> My family is cool as shit. We really are. And uh, it's every single day is an adventure. It's like you wake up in the morning and there's 25 things that I have to do that day. And I gotta make sure everybody's cool. But in order to get to the end of the day, you gotta make it fun. So we just kind of make it fun, you know? Um, it's good to be a Grohl. It's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dave Grohl, what's next for you? I don't know, bowling. Blaring Out Show.